I am Trinidad and Tobago. I am Africa. I am France. I am Scotland. I am China. And I am of the First Peoples. And I have friends, families, and neighbors who are from India, from the Middle East, and from other parts of Europe. I'm a Trini. I'm multi-ethnic, and I come from a multicultural society. Our old buildings clearly celebrate this diversity. In 1983, my involvement with the preservation lobby in Trinidad began. There I was, locked arm in arm, with like-minded friends standing in front of a bulldozer to save this building from demolition. What is it about these old buildings? What strange spells do they cast that make a normally sane person want to do this? <laughs> well, you know, we saved the building. We were able to negotiate special conditions with the planning authorities as compensation for the owners not demolishing. The building has been restored, it still stands, and it's been repurposed. But my fascination with the old buildings goes back a lot further than that. I remember as a child sitting in my grandfather's living room, tiny cottage, looking at the reflection of the colored glass in the doors as it danced and played across the floor. I remember seeing the patterns on the wall as the sun filtered through the fretwork as it moved across the sky. My grandfather built his house with his own hands. He was a joiner, a contractor, a carpenter. He owned a furniture shop. He made his own furniture. But above all, he was an artist. This was his life. He created buildings like this. We still have all his tools. We still have his fretzel. The artists and artisans who created these buildings deserve our respect for their craft. They are the ones who, with the architect George Brown, caused Port of Spain to be called the jewel of the Caribbean. And indeed, most of Trinidad adapted this kind of architecture. These artisans used details from our ancestral lands and created these buildings that give us information about our Spanish, French Creole, and British heritage. When we talk about Victorian architecture, which is the architectural category that most of these small buildings fall into, you must understand that in those days, what happened was all the artistic details that were part of Victorian architecture, most of them, actually came from the colonies that Europeans had settled in. We have clear influences where our fretwork is concerned and where our balustrade is, is concerned. We have these influences come from Islamic nations and Islamic architecture. Depending on sometimes on who the client was, you will see influences from Indian designs. This particular house, uh, the client actually went to visit the Taj Mahal and gave instructions that he wanted the vines and the flowers included in his fretwork. I can't tell you how many times I've actually seen symbols, religious symbols, both Christian, Hindu, and Muslim, incorporated into fretwork designs. These designs were custom done, and they were made by these artisans. Even the tile patterns that we see, the tiles that we saw on Granny's porch, the tiles that are in the great houses, in the churches, in the public buildings, the designs and patterns are from India and Africa. The cast iron that we know so well, that's all over Port of Spain, that's all over Trinidad and Tobago for that matter. Even that takes some of its influence from Africa. Ghana's Sankofa, the stylized heart symbol, is seen everywhere. Our old buildings tell the story of what life was like in the good old days. The fretwork, the balustrading, the way the rooms are organized. I mean, coming to think about it, really, 
the bedrooms all opened one into each other. It gave you an indication of what family life was like in those days. You have the parents in one room, the children in one room, and the grandparents in the other room. Family was important. And those fretwork panels that provided the ventilation so that it kept the house cool also had disadvantages because you had no privacy. I mean, I remember as a small child giggling and plotting with my little cousins and some, in some mischief, and we didn't even realize that our grandmother could hear us. <laughs> These buildings were created by our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. Contrary to misinformation out there, they were not built by slaves. These buildings that we cherish now and that we love came from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. But we're losing them. Every day, we are losing these buildings. And we're losing them to concrete, steel, and glass, international styles that have absolutely no bearing on anything that makes us Trinidadians. It's progress. And, and, and we have progress. We cannot deny progress. Fashions change, and as fashions change, the buildings are going to change as well. But what's so wrong about keeping the best of our heritage buildings? Why can't we preserve some of our historic neighborhoods? Let these neighborhoods contribute towards diversifying the economy. Let them contribute towards cultural heritage tourism. One of the ways we can do this is by recycling the old buildings. This encourages preservation. We can recycle our buildings. These old buildings make good restaurants, they make good bars, offices, museums, places for cottage industry, the list goes on. In the picture here, we see the Booz residence, which is now a pop, very popular restaurant on Cipriani Boulevard was built about 1883. The other building is the Rapsi House, which was turned into a consultant's office about 40 years ago. And that was one of the first buildings in, built in the Tranquility Estate when it was changed into housing lots in about 1886. A preservation industry provides a marvelous opportunity for improving our cadre of specialist workers. There are hundreds of new careers that can be created for our young people. We have professionals, we need technicians, we need artists, we need people trained in maintenance and management. The list goes on. We can take advantage of this, helping to diversify the economy, and also to bring employment to young people. These are our buildings. When we destroy them, we destroy the historical context for the cultural expressions of our people. And these small buildings are just as important as the grand decorated ones. Our architecture is joyous. It talks about the way we live, the verandas. You like to sit on the veranda and talk to your neighbor across the street in the evening, talk to the people on the road. So we took details from our ancestral lands, European technology, and added our love of life, and we built airy, joyous, comfortable buildings, and we decorated them like queens of the bands. I can't tell you how often people stop me to complain about the state of our historic buildings. My friends and I, we do this preservation lobby for love of country. We all have jobs, we all have other things that we're doing, we run businesses, we have families. That's why we need your help. And while you may not be willing to stand in front of a bulldozer, there are other things that you can do. Well, you could bring water for those of us in front of the bulldozer. <laughs> but other than that, you can you can support fundraising activities. You can attend educational programs that promote heritage tourism 
add your name to our voice so that the powers that be and the people who make the decisions will understand how important this aspect of our heritage is, will understand that the need to encourage businessmen to take advantage of the economic opportunities that come with a heritage tourism sector. When all is said and done, this is our history. This is our culture. This is our heritage. Let's preserve it. Thank you.